tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome back, friend. Done with your Christmas shopping, I take it. Well, maybe you can help me out with this one. What would one buy for a scaly prick who already has it all? Oh, hey, Chester. Didn't see you there. And how the hell are you going to wear VR goggles? Your eyeballs don't even point in the right direction. Can we be realistic here? Well, come on in, friend. I'll think of something. Hmm. There we go. So tonight, we welcome a new author to the show whom I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's T.W. Grimm, and he brings with him the longest 10-minute oil change you've ever experienced. Oh, hey. I didn't see you there. You know, Drew Bloodstark Tales is only one of the many shows on this network you could be listening to. We hope you'll subscribe to our entire lineup, including... Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, Fear from the Heartland, and Horror Hill. All available on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Also, visit simplyscarypodcast.com to become a patron. For as little as $5 a month, you get our entire catalog, ad-free, and available to download or stream. A bargain. And now, back to the show. This tale is from T.W.'s book, Trippin' Over Twilight from our pals at Velox Books. In it, we join an auto mechanic about to tackle a pretty tricky repair. So, without further delay, I give you In the Pit. Okay, Mr. Hewitt, go ahead and pull your van into the garage if you please, sir. Just drive straight ahead and you're good. The bald and pinch-faced man behind the wheel nodded and carefully pulled forward craning his head out the open window so he could make sure that he didn't somehow drive one of the front wheels into the pit. Eddie Paulson was well aware that most licensed mechanics wouldn't allow the customer to drive their own vehicle into the shop for insurance reasons, but he didn't actually have a license or insurance for that matter, so he wasn't terribly worried about it. Back in his father's day, every farmer and rural mechanic had a pit in their barn or garage, but they'd been outlawed years ago. Too many idiots had gassed themselves to death by working beneath a vehicle as it was still running. These days, a mechanic was required by law to use a hydraulic lift, or at the very least, four reliable jack stands. Eddie could potentially get into some hot water over having one on his property, but if it came down to it, the sons of bitches were more than welcome to seize his assets and all the arrears that came with them. He would pack whatever he could into his agent pickup in the middle of the night and drive off without a shred of regret. Eddie listened to the van's engine and shook his head. When he had asked John Hewitt what the problem was over the phone, Hewitt had vaguely replied, The engine's getting a bit noisy. I think it needs a tune-up. This particular statement in Eddie's experience often meant that either the timing was off or the oil was dirty and probably too low. The loud, thirsty grumbling that Eddie heard coming from beneath the caravan's hood told him that it was the latter. Oil change. Maybe scrub the gunk out of the pan. Easy money. As the caravan's back bumper disappeared into the garage, a second vehicle rocked and jounced its way into Eddie's potholed gravel driveway. It was another van. This one was a later model full-size GMC cargo van with tinted windows. There was a tiny bird-like woman perched in the driver's seat. She pulled up in front of the garage and Eddie strolled over to see what her story was. The woman saw that he was approaching and scurried out to meet him. She was wearing a dark, modest dress and clunky square-toed shoes. 
the official outfit of the rural church lady. Her lank hair framed a gruesome-looking black eye. Eddie's brow furrowed as he examined it. She'd been hit with tremendous force and was probably lucky that her eye socket hadn't been shattered. Ouch. Who's been boxing on you, lady? Hello, you're Mr. Paulson. I'm Debbie Hewitt. Debbie offered a limp skeletal hand and Eddie took it carefully into his own grease-smeared paw. She noticed that he was staring at the swollen black circle that surrounded her left eye and tried to hide it with her hair. We have a few errands to run while you're working on the van. We'll be gone for a couple of hours, I guess. Will that be long enough for you to finish what needs to be done? Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, I think that should be just enough time. Eddie grinned, and he felt bad, but not too bad. He only charged thirty bucks an hour. Lysa's mechanics charged an arm and a leg. There were plenty of guys out there who would gleefully inflict far worse damage to this trusted vehicle maintenance impaired couple's bank account than Eddie Paulson. Far, far worse. What the hell happened to your eye? The mister doesn't look like he has it in him. But, but it was none of his business, was it? Fixing cars was his business. Staying afloat on a sea of debt was his business. Eddie gave Debbie a reassuring smile and tried his best to not look at the dark, nasty bruising around her eye socket. She attempted to smile back and could only manage a strained, tired grimace. The warm September breeze gusted and blew Debbie's hair back, and Eddie's smile froze on his face. Most of her right ear was missing, removed, gone. All that remained was her earlobe, a few mangled ridges of cartilage, and a gaping hole. Paulson stared at it in horror. The scar tissue was hideous. Holy fuck, lady. Your ear! The mechanic was startled back to his senses by the sound of the minivan's door slamming shut. John Hewitt came out of the garage clutching a precarious double armful of children's toys and books. His smile still frozen in place, Eddie said, You've got kids, I see. The gusting breeze dwindled and Mrs. Hewitt's fine fluttering hair dropped mercifully to cover what was left of her ear. She hesitated, squirmed uncomfortably, then abruptly blurted out, Yes, we have a son. His name is Charlie. He has trouble pronouncing that, so we just call him Arlie. Oh? How old's the lad? Pretty young still, I'm guessing. Eddie pointed over at the mound of colorful playthings in her husband's arms. Um, well... John trailed off. His wife looked on anxiously, as if she were silently apologizing for some unknown transgression. He shook his head at her and muttered, He's an adult, but not mentally, Mr. Paulson. Our son is impaired, and he has several emotional problems. Harley takes medications to keep him even, but my insurance only covers so much, and these pills... John's lips thinned into a hard, bitter slash on his face. They cost the earth, these pills. We've been clean out of them for almost three weeks. John swallowed hard and held his hand over his sternum for a moment, grimacing. Eddie recognized these motions from personal experience as an acid reflux attack, probably the kind caused by stress. Hewitt groped for words, then stifled a sour belch and simply said, It's been hard on us, Mr. Paulson. The good Lord knows that our little family has known many hardships. Praise him. Praise him. Debbie echoed automatically, and John Hewitt nodded in approval. There was a brief awkward silence. Eddie was uncertain as to what he should say to the couple, if anything. Should he say that he was sorry? Or would that seem like he was looking down at them and their situation? Should he offer up another praise him to the good man above? And what the hell happened to your wife's ear? But that last bit was not his concern, was it? Eddie decided that a grave sympathetic nod would probably be the best way to go. Well, I could tell you that you've got no worries here. You folks are in good hands. 
It'll be done by the time you get back, and it'll be done right. I've been a mechanic for over twenty years. I know a thing or two about the trade. He winced inwardly as he said this. It was probably just an oil change, for Christ's sake. But Eddie wanted to make this strangely uptight couple feel a little easier about at least one of their troubles. Debbie rewarded his effort with a strange smile. I suppose we'll be on our way, then. She cleared her throat and looked at her watch. Mr. Turnbull assured John that you are very good, so I'm sure that we have nothing to worry about. Frank Turnbull was an old friend and faithful customer, and was the one responsible for this particular referral. John Hewitt worked in the main office of the factory where Frankie spent his days slugging it out on the line. Frank had overheard Hewitt asking around in the cafeteria if anyone knew a trustworthy and reasonably priced mechanic, so he ambled over to Hewitt's table and volunteered the services of his old pal Eddie Paulson. Referrals were pretty much the only way a rural backyard mechanic such as Eddie could advertise his trade. They were his bread and butter. But no, ma'am. Old Frankie didn't steer you wrong. I can guarantee you that you have nothing to worry about. Your vehicle will be running like a dream when you get back. A powerful blow against the side of the cargo van cut Eddie off mid-sentence and made him jump several inches off the ground. Simultaneously, a grating voice boomed out. Bingo! All you want's bingo! The voice was high-pitched, but at the same time coarse and gravelly. It stabbed Eddie's eardrums and made the hair stand up on his arms. The Hewitts also involuntarily cringed away from it as well, and Eddie thought that he saw fear in their eyes. His smile, once again a brittle replica of the real thing, Eddie said, Say, folks, is everything okay? Both Hewitts ignored him completely. They appeared to be caught in a state of mountain mutual panic. Debbie whispered, Did you bring Pinkle, John? Please tell me you brought the damn thing. Please. I didn't see it in the van, John hissed back at her. And I didn't know that I was supposed to bring it in the first place. I thought Arlie said he doesn't like the thing anymore. He loves that thing, John. You know that. Loves it! Debbie shrieked, and her eyes were wide and wet. Eddie was officially uncomfortable with the situation. He took a couple steps back from the couple, his hands held out before him, and tried to think of something he might say to stop the situation from spiraling any further south. What the hell were they going on about anyway? The bellowing thing in the back of the cargo van, was that their son? Paulson opened his mouth to speak, and <laughs> another powerful blow against the interior of the GMC made him stumble back and almost fall on his narrow, coverall-clad ass. There was now a large, outward bulge of dent in one of the GMC's rear quarter panels. Eddie gaped at this like a fish. Holy shit, Eddie thought. Did he just do that with his fist? Bingo! I need one bingo now! What do we do? Debbie asked her husband, and there was no mistaking it. She was panicking. So was he. I don't know, he whispered, and his eyes grew bright with rising tears. I don't know. Eddie tried again. Hey, guys? Guys, is everything okay? I take it you've lost something? It's a stuffed toy, Debbie said, finally noticing him again. Bullwinkle, from that old Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoon. Could you please look for it, Mr. Paulson, while we deal with this? Please? It might be somewhere in the caravan. Arlie's very attached to it. Okay, sure. No problem. Eddie grinned, and that grin was about as real as a three-dollar bill. His one and only thought at this point was go away, you Bible-thumping weirdos, and take whatever's in the back of the GMC with you. Paulson decided as he ducked into the interior of the caravan that he would definitely be parking it off his property when he was done. He'd tape a handwritten bill on the windshield and they could leave the money in the mailbox for all he cared. 
and fuck Frankie Turnbull. He would have a few choice words for Frankie the next time he saw him. Oh, yes, indeed. Frankie was going to get an earful. After casting one last cautious glance at the Hewitts, Eddie slid open the minivan's side door. Oh, for crying out loud, look at that. Buddy forgot to leave the damn key in the ignition and crammed himself between the two rear bench seats. Keeping an ear open for trouble outside, he blindly groped around beneath the seats, seeking out an object that was soft and plush. Eddie's hand happened upon something sticky. Oh, what the fuck is that? Ooh. Then touched something hard and plastic. It was a G.I. Joe action figure, one of the bad guys. He tossed it aside and thought, this is beyond ridiculous. What the hell am I even doing here? He heard the GMC side door open, then slam shut. Arlie barked something in a demanding tone. Debbie responded, her voice soft and pleading. Arlie raised his voice into a near shout, loud enough for Eddie to catch a few words. Binko. Now Arlie. Mama's bad. Right now. Debbie raised her voice as well, and Eddie heard her screech. Don't you do that, Arlie, no! Don't you even think about it! From somewhere nearby, John Hewitt shouted, Arlie, you stop it right now, do you hear me? You don't do things like that to your mother or me, not ever again! Do you understand me, son? His tone was meant to be threatening, but it was not. Hewitt was very, very afraid. Eddie Paulson abruptly understood that the situation with the Hewitts and their son was not merely uncomfortable and weird. It was dangerous. Her black eye. Her ear. Eddie pulled himself up from between the seats into a kneeling position so that he could peer out the dusty rear windshield. He saw John striding toward the GMC stiffly, his arms still full of toys. Hey! Eddie didn't know what was about to happen, but he knew that he didn't want it to happen here, on his property, with him as a witness. Nope. You know what? I think maybe you folks ought to get going now, okay? This isn't gonna work for me. <coughs> Arlie let loose a shrill, infuriated bellow, then shrieked. Arlie will bite! Debbie Hewitt screamed and all hell broke loose. John yelled his wife's name and threw his brightly colored burden into the air, sprinting the last few steps to the van like a track star. The toys arced up and away to either side of him in twin sprays of twinkling plastic and fake fur. They looked for a moment like two magical rainbows out of a child's dream. Debbie screamed again, and this time she didn't stop. As John was flinging open the side door of the GMC, Eddie was scuffling ass first out of the caravan with his heart yammering in his chest and his blood roaring with adrenaline. He seized the first weapon-worthy tool that he laid eyes on, a rusted and cobweb-covered pipe wrench that had been leaning up against the wall for an eternity. Outside, John shrieked, Debbie! and dove head first into the cacophonous struggle inside with his fist swinging. Paulson ran toward the van at top speed, his pipe wrench raised high in a two-fisted grip and his skinny legs pumping. He was halfway there when Debbie flopped out of the GMC and fell like a rag doll into the driveway. The sight of her brought Eddie to a stumbling halt. She was torn and mangled and covered in blood. Covered. There was so much of it that it was impossible to tell where it was even coming from. Debbie had been reduced to a shredded, flailing stick figure, shrieking and dripping crimson. She began to struggle away from the van on her belly, leaving a broad streak of red behind her to mark her progress. It was now John who was screaming inside the van, screaming like a small animal caught in the jaws of a trap. His mind reeling from an overload of panicked adrenaline, Eddie darted over to where Debbie was worming along on her belly across the gravel driveway and seized one of her blood-slicked hands, meaning to drag the injured woman to safety. Come on, let's go. 
Eddie hollered and he pulled. And with a wet little rip, Debbie Hewitt's mutilated arm came off at the shoulder. Eddie stumbled backwards and this time he actually fell. His legs were made of water. Paulson regarded the wet chewed up appendage in his hand for a moment with uncomprehending eyes, then uttered a thin shriek and threw it aside. It landed on his lawn. At the same instant, John lunged halfway out of the van and scrabbled at the gravel for purchase, trying to drag himself free of the hulking shadow that loomed behind him. Hewitt's nose and lips were gone. His mouth was a screaming crescent beneath a hollow of churned up meat. The man's hands had been chewed and gnawed into grotesque little stubs. They left bloody smears on the pale gravel stones as they slapped and flailed at the ground. Paulson lurched to his feet and stumbled over to where the pipe wrench had skidded to a halt in the thin line of creeping Charlie that bordered his driveway. He seized it and whirled around, just in time to witness John being dragged back into the shadowed depths of the cargo van. His legs popped out of the open door and began to vigorously kick at the air. An instant later, Hewitt's fire engine wailing choked off and became a wet, agonized gurgling. John's legs ceased their flailing and stiffened straight out, jittering and tremoring midair in a meaningless dance. Eddie knocked the man's legs aside and swung the pipe wrench with everything he had. It thunked into the enormous slouched backside of the thing that was fastened onto Hewitt's throat, ah! right in the kidney. The hulking thing let out a muffled glurp and raised its head. Blood spilled from its gaping maw in untidy streams. The creature's mouth looked like the yawning entrance to hell lined with a savage jumble of sharp leaning teeth. Eddie froze. Arlie, he whispered. Arlie blinked at him and sputtered through a mouthful of blood. Hey, that hurt. Arlie's pupils were completely square, like a goat. Eddie let out a roar that was more terror than bravery and swung the pipe wrench again as hard as he could straight at the monstrosity's gigantic skull. It whistled through the air like a warhead and it stopped dead in the middle of a ham-sized fist. Arlie snarled. No! You are bad! And ripped the wrench out of Paulson's death grip with a slight jerk of his massive wrist. Eddie's little finger got caught in the hole at the bottom of the handle and snapped sideways at a 90 degree angle right before the second knuckle. He barely even felt it. He was already running for the closest possible shelter, his garage. Arlie let out a flim choked growl behind him and gave chase. Paulson could actually hear and feel the monstrosity's approach. It was like being chased by an enraged rhinoceros with a taste for blood. Paulson ran into the garage and went to lunge for the caravan's passenger side door, but there was no time to jump in. Arlie's bellow and shadow was almost upon him. Instead, he scampered to the front of the van, and with an athletic grace born out of mortal terror, he dove feet first into the narrow space between the bumper and the edge of the pit. Hewitt had pulled the van a little too far ahead, leaving a gap that was slightly too small for even Eddie's thin frame. He cruelly scraped his entire backside against the rough concrete edge of the pit and slammed his forehead off the bumper. Paulson went limp and landed on his left ankle, forcing it to roll into an unnatural angle. Eddie's fibula snapped. It made the flaying of his back seem insignificant in comparison. The mechanic screamed and instinctively lunged away from the unbearable blast of agony in his ankle. He rammed the top of his head into the oil pan and stars exploded across his vision. A galaxy of brilliant stars. Eddie was unconscious before his face hit the hard floor of the pit. For a long while, his world was nothing more than black and silence. Saturday, September 23rd, 3.17 p.m. 
Somewhere nearby, a woman was screaming. Eddie became aware that he was lying on his stomach in a place that was dark, cold, and rough to the touch. Where? His face was pushed into a damp corner, and a woman was screaming like a banshee. He pushed himself up upon shaken arms and grimly fought the urge to vomit. Sweet Jesus, his head. He'd smashed it off something, and hard. What? Where was he? Why wasn't he in bed? Who the fuck was screaming for Christ's sake? In a sickening rush, Eddie abruptly remembered where he was and why he was there. The Hewitts, their son, and what he had done to them. The minivan. He had whammed his head off of their minivan. Twice. The van in question was currently parked above him. He was in the pit, and blood was trickling merrily down the side of his face from an enormous gash in his scalp. His ankle ached, and there was a sharp, nasty throb in his little finger as well. It was swollen like a sausage and looked a bit like a lowercase r. God damn, I'm a mess. Paulson tried to heave himself up to a standing crouch, and... Oh, holy Jesus! His ankle. Sweet mother of mercy, his motherfucking ankle. Eddie fell onto his ass and scrambled frantically to unlace his work boot, keening like a wounded animal as he struggled to get the knot undone. He kept his broken pinky finger sticking out and away from the action, as if he were trying to lend some Victorian tea-time class to the proceedings. The light was dim and his fingers were clumsy in the face of the agony that roared beneath them. A number of long, agonizing seconds ticked by before the boot was finally undone. Eddie was soaked through with sweat. He clenched his teeth, tensed his body against what was to come, and yanked the boot off. God damn! He howled, and Debbie Hewitt answered him with an anguished howl of her own. Eddie barely even heard her. He was too busy fighting to remove the woolen sock on his left foot. It felt at least a hundred times too small, a Ken doll sock that had been magically stretched onto his foot by a malicious wizard. He bared his teeth against the pain and pulled off the sock with hands that shook like they were palsied. There was a swift relief from the unbearable pressure on his ankle, but it was immediately replaced by a sharp, piercing ache that swelled up and up and up into the unseen sky above. His ankle was grotesquely swollen, and touching it sent spasms of pain racing up his leg. Eddie carefully pulled himself up alongside the wall of the pit and performed an awkward crouch hop to the rear of the van. He peered out through the space between the floor of the garage and the back bumper, and immediately wished he hadn't. Arlie was sitting on the sparse lawn, basking in the mellow sun rays of a beautiful late summer's afternoon. This was Eddie's first clear look at him in the daylight, and he had to stifle a gasp of horror against the back of his hand. The Hewitt son appeared to be the end result of a horrific genetic mutation. He was a monster. It was difficult to gauge his height due to the fact he was sitting, but Arlie looked to be in the neighborhood of seven feet tall, and was almost as wide. He had a huge, bulging gut and shoulders like basketballs. The blood-splattered jogging suit he wore had to be custom-made. The leg of a triple XL wouldn't even stretch around this ogre's enormous foot, let alone the tree trunk calf that it was attached to. Sweet Jesus, look at that thing. He must weigh five hundred pounds at least. Probably more. Arlie's head was gigantic and misshapen, a Picasso nightmare topped by a circular tuft of sand-colored fluff. His eyes weren't level with each other. His nose was an underdeveloped nub of cartilage, and his brow was deeply shelled by Neanderthal ridges of bone. Arlie grinned vacantly up at the blue sky above, observing the passage of the clouds with simple-minded delight. His mouth was a crowded horror of random jostling fangs. He looked to Eddie to be a bizarre and nightmarish combination of human, hippopotamus, gargoyle, and goat. Debbie Hewitt lay face down in the duck grass and clover in front of him, 
the hand on a remaining arm clutching feebly for purchase in the sod. Even though she wasn't much more than a pile of blood-soaked rags at this point, Debbie was still trying to get away. Eddie didn't blame her. Arlie was pulling bits of flesh from her legs and popping them into his slobbery maw like they were popcorn chicken. As Eddie watched, his mouth turned down in disgust. Arlie pulled on a slippery tendon until it snapped, then tried to suck it up like a spaghetti noodle. A particularly amusing cloud caught his attention, and he giggled through clenched teeth. <laughs> Debbie's husband still lay where Eddie had last seen him, flat on his back in the GMC with his legs trailing out of the open side door. He was most certainly dead. Praise him, Eddie thought, and he shuddered. I'm gonna call the cops, freak, he murmured. Then you can eat some hot fucking lead. How's that? Eddie reached for his cell. It was gone. It wasn't in his hip pocket anymore. It wasn't in any of his fucking pockets. Eddie realized that he was crying. It was becoming extremely difficult not to give in to raw, hysterical panic. He dropped down onto his hands and knees and scoured the entire floor of the pit, taking great care not to bump his ankle or his poor, crooked pinky finger. All he found was a slot-headed screwdriver, a small pile of oily rags, and a dead Bic lighter. No phone. What am I gonna do? He whispered. Tears dripped from the stubble on his cheeks and pattered like rain onto the concrete floor. He had saved himself, sure, but now what? He was trapped. Trapped like a rat in his goddamn pit. It was Saturday afternoon and Eddie didn't have another job booked until Wednesday at 2 p.m. His nearest neighbor was a stone-deaf farmer that lived over a mile away. Between their properties, there was nothing but acres of thick bush and deep gullies. Eddie was a lifelong bachelor with no close family to become concerned by his absence. He did have friends and relatives, but days, even weeks often went by between phone calls and visits. He was a solitary man by nature, Eddie Paulson was. He could be missing for a long time before anyone even thought to check on him. He could die in this pit, and no one would know. Saturday, September 23rd, 8.10 p.m. Eddie was in too much pain to be hungry, but he was thirsty. Very thirsty, in fact. This was mildly ironic because he also had to take a piss very, very badly. Arlie had stopped treating his mother's mutilated legs like a buffet not long after she gasped her last breath and trimmered her last trimmer. This happened shortly before 6 o'clock, 5.59 p.m. to be exact. For some reason, Eddie had noted the time of her death on his watch. The lumbering monstrosity had let out a yawn, stretched and ambled off out of view, heading towards the house. Eddie had heard a crash as the giant kicked in his back door with one powerful thrust of his leg, then heard nothing more. Now there was only the gently gusting wind, stirring the leaves of the big maple tree in the front yard, and Paulson's own harsh, heavy breathing. Where is he? Is he in the house still? Where the fuck are you, you son of a bitch? I gotta go pee, Eddie croaked, and the stark simplicity of this statement made him want to cry again. He had to take a piss, but he couldn't. He wanted to drink a tall glass of water, but he couldn't. How the fuck did this happen? How the fuck? Eddie hadn't heard anything from Arlie in over two hours. His bladder was starting to scream. It was time to gather his courage and get the fuck out. The keys were in his truck. It was parked right beside the garage, no more than 20 feet from his current position in the pit. Even if he crawled there, Eddie could slide behind the wheel and be gone within minutes. He took one last look outside from the rear of the pit, then scuffle hopped quickly to the front, already sweating in the face of what he was about to do. His hand stole into the big hip pocket of his coveralls and touched the screwdriver, seeking even a small amount of reassurance, then slowly pushed his head through the narrow gap between the edge of the pit and the minivan's bumper. 
Eddie paused for a moment to listen, then braced his arms against the garage floor and heaved himself up. The bumper scraped against his lacerated back and ripped away the soft new scabs. Paulson growled a muffled curse from between clenched teeth and kept going. It was an extremely tight fit. How he had ever managed to jump through that scant space in one go was a mystery. Christ Almighty, his fucking phone. Somewhere out in the yard, his cell phone was ringing away like a funeral bell. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Eddie heard the creaky side door of his house blam open and Arlie bellowed. Phone call! <laughs> he laughed a high pitch. <laughs> that raked and jagged fingernails across Eddie's brain. You got a phone call, mister! Fuck, 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 I'm stuck. And he was. Paulson, as skinny as he was, still managed to get stuck at the waist in the gap. The rough concrete edge bit into his stomach on one side and the bumper pushed hard at his back on the other. The mechanic began to furiously wiggle back and forth, looking like a fish that's been stranded on a hard and rocky beach. <laughs> Come on. God damn it. <laughs> Fuck. Shit. Fuck. Outside, the phone abruptly stopped in mid-ring. Eddie redoubled his efforts and was rewarded with a sudden slide backward. The edge of the pit popped the tarnished snaps off his coveralls as he slid, and they skittered away into the shadows. <sighs> oh, thank God. I thought I was stuck. Eddie stopped dead at his chest. The air squeezed from his lungs in a pained whoosh. He flailed his arms and Arlie stomped into view from around the passenger side of the van. He was grinning, and his teeth were savage spears. The cell phone looked like a novelty miniature in his hand. Arlie smiled down at Eddie's terrified face and chirped. <laughs> you met your phone call. N you want to call him back? Eddie opened his mouth to shriek, and Arlie swooped down, his goat eyes burning with magical glee. With surgical precision, he jabbed the edge of the cell phone into Eddie Paulson's front teeth, shattering them. They tumbled down his throat in fragments, and Eddie choked. <laughs> Arlie whooped in delight and hammered the hard plastic rectangle onto his prey's unprotected skull, right dead center on the bloody knot that already existed there. There was a brittle pop, and the phone shattered. Eddie saw a flash of darkness across his vision, and he knew that this was it. In the next few moments, he was going to die. <laughs> no, you motherfucker! Paulson bellowed, and his words speckled the garage floor with red. <laughs> you leave me alone! He heaved with the miracle strength of a rampage in panic and dropped back into the pit. Agony exploded in his ankle, and Eddie screamed up at the minivan's rusty undercarriage with all his might. He retched a thin stream of bile and curled into the fetal position. Arlie crouched and peered down at him with those bizarre square pupils like a goat or a demon. The sun was setting, and the garage was now thickly cast in dark shadows, but Eddie could still clearly see Arlie's eyes. They were casting a dull greenish-white glow in the gathering darkness. He can see in the dark, like a cat. Arlie's gonna kill you, mister. He hates you. You're bad. Arlie snapped his fearsome teeth together. The sound was hard and sharp in the silence. Arlie will bite. You have to stop this, Eddie wheezed. He hurt, crossed above how he hurt. You're the one who's being bad, Arlie, not me. You have to stop this, right now. In an instant, the mutant's enormous hand was clenching at the air just above Paulson's head. He flattened himself to the floor and squirmed away on his back, gritting his teeth against the pain. 
She don't you say that. Arlie is good. Arlie is always good. The monster's fury was terrifying. He roared at the ceiling and seized hold of the caravan's front end. With a scream of effort, he began to lift, and the front tires steadily rose until they were a heart stopping four inches above the floor. Oh, fuck. Oh, holy fucking shit. Harley's leg shook. He groaned, and he dropped the van with an angry grunt. It landed and rocked noisily on its suspension. Harley hammered on the hood with his fist, and he gasped. <laughs> Arlie is good. Don't you forget that, Dink! The Hewitt's delightful baby boy began to pace around the garage, muttering darkly to himself and shoving things aside as he did so. Eddie waited to see what would happen next. His heart was in his throat. Arlie crouched down to peer into the pit, his eyes bright and full of murder. He tried to speak, but unable to find the words in his limited vocabulary that might adequately express his hatred, he growled like a dog instead. Stay away from me, Eddie whispered. Leave me alone and stay away, Arlie grinned. No, he said. Not until you're dead and there's nothing left but bones. Please. Nope. Harley grinned even wider. His eyes gleamed down at Eddie with a flat, murderous glow. Not ever. Not until you're dead. Not until you're nothing but bones on your floor. <laughs> Sunday, September 24th, 12.25 a.m. The pain from his injuries was very, very bad. But Eddie's thirst was rapidly becoming a serious problem in its own right. He couldn't stop fantasizing about the simple act of swallowing some cool, pleasant-tasting liquid. It was driving him mad. The best-case scenario, undoubtedly, would be a cold can of Budweiser. The sort of cold that coaxes a flood of condensation that creates a puddle around the base of the can. Cold to the point of almost being slush. Just thinking of it made his arid throat clench like a fist. Oh, sweet Jesus, a cold beer. Was there ever anything finer? Worst case, a mud puddle would do. Shit, yes, that'd do just fine. There was a fair-sized puddle at the end of the driveway, still bloated from the recent rains. Eddie imagined in great detail how he might slink out of the pit and crawl over to that stagnant little pool on his hands and knees. He would plunge his face into its murky depths and suck the thick water down like it was Perrier. Paulson had not seen hide nor hair of Arlie since he had been beaten stupid with his own cell phone. He was relatively sure that the murderous freak was taking a snooze somewhere in the house, but not completely. He might very well be standing just outside the open garage door waiting with a dullard's patience for his prey to scuttle out of his hidey hole and expose itself. Those teeth. His pain and thirst were stronger than his fear, though. Eddie had to get the fuck out of the pit and find help. If he didn't, he would eventually die of either thirst, infection, or... or Arlie would get him. It was time to have another go at escaping his prison. Eddie held his breath and listened hard, and he heard nothing but the crickets. Arlie was fast asleep, Snoring away on Eddie's sagging couch, with his feet dangling over the arm and a throw pillow clutched to his chest for security. Deeply asleep. Maybe. You can do this. You have to do this. Outside of the garage, it was a bright moonlit night, but the pit was draped in the blackness so absolute that Eddie couldn't see his hand in front of his face. He could only perceive the narrow gap between the bumper and the edge of the pit as a slice of charcoal gray that floated in the darkness above him. Cautiously, Eddie eased his good hand through that gap and into the open. Slowly. Slowly. He felt the cold, rough surface of the garage floor beneath his palm. 
He rubbed his palm against it and tried to control his breathing. I licked the dew off the goddamn grass and then into the truck I go. I'll start her up and peel out of here like lightning. There was a hushed footstep somewhere very close in the deep gloom. The scrape of a shoe against the concrete. Eddie's wrist was suddenly encircled by a moist, fleshy vice. He shrieked and tried to jerk his arm back into the safety of the pit and almost dislocated his shoulder in the process. Harley's grip was like iron. He's got me. He's got me. He's fucking got me. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Harley can't sleep, mister. Harley can't sleep at all. Harley wants Binko. His tone was calm, almost serene. At some point during the last few hours, Arlie's bellowing rage had cooled into a state of cold, narrow-eyed sadism. Eddie could feel it in his grip, thrumming beneath the giant's thick, dry skin like electricity, an out-of-control desire to hurt something, to inflict unbearable pain at his leisure. Eddie had been reduced to the role of a fly in the cruel hands of a troubled schoolboy. This is going to be bad. God help me. Arlie, I don't know where Binkle is. I'm sorry. I don't know, but... He quickly added, trying to make his trembling croak sound bright and hopeful. I think I can maybe help you find him. Sure I can. The only thing is, I'm hurting pretty bad down here, buddy. And I'm really thirsty. So, if you, maybe, you know, if you just let me go and don't hurt me anymore... I'll help you find Binkle, okay? Promise. And then you can get some sleep. All you have to do is let me go and then I'll get out of this pit and, and I can help you look, okay? There was a long considering silence. Eddie stood awkwardly on one foot in the dark, his wrist compressed to the point of shattering, and he prayed. No! You can't find Binkle, dummy! Nobody can. Pinkle's gone. There was a dark undercurrent of joviality in his voice, as if Arlie was amused by a private jest. Eddie began to shake. You can't say that, he whimpered breathless. Come on, buddy. You can't say that. You know that he's around here somewhere, right? Sure he is. We'll find him together, you and me. Shut up, Arlie said patiently and bore down on Eddie's wrist with a few more pounds of pressure to illustrate his point. Down in the pit, Eddie writhed and bit down on a scream. Binkle's not here. He's not anywhere. Binkle's gone. Arlie killed Binkle. Arlie ripped Binkle's head off and put him in the garbage, and now he's gone. And you're a liar. Uh, no, uh, how could I possibly know any of that? I, I wasn't lying, I, I just didn't know. You lied and you hit Arlie, remember? You swear and you say the F word. You even said Arlie is bad, remember? No, you're bad, mister, and Arlie will bite. Eddie was yanked forward with tremendous force. His body jerked like a rag doll and he hit the wall of the pit face first. His nose broke against the cement and gushed an immediate geyser of blood that coursed hot and salt all over his mouth and chin. Stars exploded into brilliant novas in the dark. An instant later, a vice made of razors and fire snapped shut on his forearm. Oh, holy fucking shit! Eddie screamed, and Arlie took a second bite in response. The agony was a raging tsunami that raced up his arm and slammed full force into his brain, drowning his brain in panic. Like magic, the handle of the screwdriver was suddenly clenched in the awkward three-fingered fist of his other hand, and Eddie was stabbing out into the shadows, stabbing and shrieking and crying hysterically. The gleaming point sank home, and Arlie roared. He released his grip, and Eddie collapsed. Oh! You think? 
You dabbed Artie in the face! Ow! The bites on Eddie's forearm leaked countless rivulets of hot blood onto the floor. He scrabbled around blindly for the dirty rags and used one as a tourniquet, tying it over the sleeve of his coveralls with his bad hand in his teeth. <laughs> Fuck you, freak. You better believe I'll do it again. I'll put your fucking eye out next time. Remember that, you piece of shit. Arlie staggered away from the van, bawling incoherent threats and stamping his feet. Eddie crumpled around his arm and fought the urge to vomit. The sleeve of his coveralls was soaked through with his own blood, coppery and warm. Arlie bumped into the workbench and hollered, <laughs> And you can't hide under there and fight dirty like that, you chicken! Arlie will get you! He'll fix you! You think you good? A small object whizzed through the air just a few inches to the left of Eddie's temple. A split second later, the high, teeny click of something metal striking cement buzzed painfully in his ear. Another projectile bounced off his shoulder, sharp and hard. Yet another ricocheted off a wall and struck him in the leg. They were bolts. Arlie had found the mason jar full of odd mixed bolts that Eddie kept on his workbench and was whipping them down into the pit, using them as makeshift artillery. Eddie curled into a protective ball and endured a seemingly endless rain of them. It hurt. Arlie had one hell of a pitching arm on him. Then came a hell of sockets from his socket set. They were followed by ball bearings, screws, spark plugs, anything on hand that was small, hard, and easy to throw into the narrow gap. <laughs> Fuck you, asshole. Stop it. Leave me alone. Get away from me. There was a considerate pause. Why? <laughs> Why? Why? Because you can't do this to people. That's fucking why, you freaking psycho. It's murder. So? There are laws that everyone has to live by in this world, idiot. Follow me? Not killing people is one of them. You can't do it. Arnie don't care about laws. Arnie can do whatever he wants. Who's gonna stop him? It's just you and me out here, mister. There ain't no laws when no one is looking. Eddie cradled his arm to his chest and began to sob. There would be no bargaining with this creature, and he was stupid to think otherwise. Arlie would do as he pleased until Eddie was finally dead, and that was that. You son of a bitch! You hell-spawned piece of shit! You should have been aborted with the coat hanger! You should have never been born! Eddie didn't recognize his own voice. You know that? They should have scraped you out of your mother and flushed you down the drain. And good goddamn riddance. Eddie heard the garage door sliding shut, and his heart lurched. He mewled pitifully. No, don't close it. Don't close the door. It's pitch fucking black in here, and I'm hurt, you bastard. I'm hurt. Don't you close that door on me. The heavy aluminum door slammed shut on Eddie's screams. Arlie went back into the house and took a massive shit on Eddie's bed. Feeling lighter and at least partially avenged now, the lumber and horror made himself a nest down on the living room floor, and he fell asleep while watching old reruns of cartoons on Eddie's TV. Not long after Arlie began to snore, Eddie finally stopped screaming. Sunday, September 24th 9.20 a.m. Paulson passed out from exhaustion just before dawn, curled up on the hard, cold floor of the pit like a dead thing. He awoke to the sound of the garage door being dragged open. Footsteps, and then crunching, chewing, slurping. Arnie likes Captain Crunch, mister, but you got frosted flakes, and they're okay, too. I like milk a lot. Do you like milk? Eddie wasn't feeling so great. He was feverish. His arm and ankle hurt wretchedly, and all his other numerous injuries paled in comparison. His tongue felt too thick for his mouth, and his throat was on fire. 
Eddie's poor throat felt the way his south-facing side yard often looked in the middle of August. Baked and dead, dried into an arid series of ridges and crevices. A no-man's land of dead grass and shimmering heat. And then there was this. Harley had milk. White, cold, fresh, wet, nourishing milk. Eddie imagined it slipping down his parched throat like a cold wave of liquid bliss and whimpered. Sweet Christ above. Milk. Arlie, please, milk. Paulson's voice barely sounded human. Speaking was torture. You sound like the cookie monster. You want cookies, don't you, mister? And milk, right? You want milk? He chuckled and continued scarfing down the sopping wet breakfast cereal as Eddie struggled to hold in dry, acidic tears. Harley wasn't going to give him any fucking milk. No. He would lure Eddie close and then... Well, Harley would bite. And bite. And bite. Fuck you. You know I won't, sir. I'm dying down here. Don't you get it? I'm suffering from dehydration. Do you know what that is? Nope, Harley grunted. There was the ring of a spoon being set down in an empty bowl, and then the rattling tinkle of a second helping being dumped into the bowl. More milk was poured, and the crunching and slurping recommenced. Oh, you motherfucker. You're going to kill me with thirst, is that it? Because you can't reach me? That's cowardly. You're a piece of shit coward, Arlie. Don't know what that means, neither. And Arlie don't care. Crunch, crunch, slurp. Paulson heaved himself up into a sitting position, his back against the wall. He winced at the side of the left sleeve of his coveralls. It was caked with stiff maroon blood. Carefully, Eddie pushed up the cracking material and gasped at what he saw. His forearm was pitted deeply by two wide, ragged craters. Bone was exposed. The edges of the bites were lined with thick, frayed shreds of skin and torn muscle fiber. Small yellow curds of fat had oozed out and dried into sticky flakes and scales on the surrounding skin. He couldn't close his left hand into a fist anymore. Attempting to do so resulted in a flare of ripping agony in the bite wounds and fluttering tremors in his fingers. <sighs> Fucked me right the fuck up, didn't he? There was nothing on hand that Eddie could use to treat or dress the ugly crescent-shaped holes in his arm. The oily rags were a poor choice. He could only carefully pull his sleeve back down and grit his teeth. Hey, mister! Arlie chirped, his voice muffled by cereal. Maybe, maybe, Arnie will give you a big bowl of cereal and you can tell him where Binkle is. Where's Binkle, huh? You tore the fucking thing's head off and tossed it in the garbage, Eddie croaked. Then you freaked out because it was gone and ate your own parents. Now you're trying to kill me. That's what happened to Binkle, you crazy fuck. You talk too much. You talk and talk, but you don't say anything. You're a dummy. Oh, yeah? Well, how's about this? I know where one of your G.I. Joe toys are. You lost it in the van. He's one of your favorite guys, too, I bet. Um, silver-headed guy. What the fuck is his name? Come on, think, goddammit. Think, think, think. What the fuck is his name? Destro, I know where he is. The glowing eyes above him blinked in surprise. Yeah? Harley's face darkened. He snarled. You better not be lying, Dink. You better tell Arnie where he is. Right now. It's in the van, asshole. Just slide open that side door and have a look around in the back. On the floor. You'll see it. Harley scrambled to his feet and the caravan side door was violently slammed open. The van groaned and sank alarmingly beneath Harley's weight. They didn't cart your giant ass around in the minivan very often, did they? Suspension would be shot all to hell. That was what the cargo van was for. 
You. You were the cargo. Harley barked a high-pitched yelp of surprise and got down on his hands and knees beside the minivan. A thick, stubby-fingered hand waved Destro around for Eddie to see. I found him! Destro! Destro! There. I helped you find him. Now you owe me. How about this? Let me go. Nope. Why not? Why not, really? Just, just let me go. Eddie realized that he was pleading, but he couldn't stop himself. You could, hell, you could just stand back and let me get out of here any old time you want to. Why not? Just let me go. I'm in a bad way down here, and I need a hospital, Harley. I need- Shut up! No. If Harley lets you go, mister, you'll tell on him, and Harley will get in trouble. The law, remember? You can't go. You can't ever go. A pathetic whining tirade against the unfairness of Harley's decision rose in his throat and died on his swollen, blood-caked lips. Pleading would do no good. Instead, Eddie croaked. Okay, fine, whatever. Give me a big bowl of those frosted flakes, then. You owe it to me. And pour in lots of milk. No. Why, though? Eddie whispered. The tears were flowing, fat little balls of precious moisture that stung as they rolled down his face. I found Destro for you, asshole. I need it. I'll die if I don't get it, Harley. Harley wants you to die, Harley explained patiently. It's taking too long. Hurry up and die already. Then fuck you. How's that? Fuck you. Eddie slashed at the air around him with his screwdriver and screamed profanities as loud as he could. It hurt his poor withered throat terribly to do so, but it felt good, too. Delirious with rage, he pointed at Arlie with the screwdriver and shouted, Your mom and dad were brother and sister, weren't they? Yeah, that's why you're all fucked up, you inbred cocksucker! How's that? How the fuck you like that, dickhead? Harley's grin abruptly disappeared. He bared his teeth and bounced up from the floor of the garage as if he were on springs, all 500-plus pounds of them, and he howled. Don't you say that! An instant later, he slammed into the side of the van like a charging bull. A window exploded in a shower of glass and the heavy vehicle skidded several inches across the floor above him. Eddie shrieked. Don't you say that, don't you? The vehicle rocked and swayed beneath the force of Arlie's blows. Fiberglass dented and shattered into jagged fragments. Howling like a missile siren, Arlie stooped down to seize hold of the rocker panel and frame, and he grunted and strained to deadlift the van off the pit. Eddie watched with eyes like saucers as the tire smoothly rose nine inches from the garage floor. Ten. Eleven. He's gonna do it. Holy Jesus, he's gonna throw the goddamn thing over. The screwdriver. Eddie lunged forward and tried to stab it into the back of Arlie's hand, but missed. Instead, the sharp edge slammed into the blunt tip of his finger and severed it almost completely. Harley screamed and dropped the van like a hot stone. Eddie fell to the floor to avoid having the top of his head flattened by the exhaust pipe, and he landed tailbone first on the cluster of sockets. He screeched in pain and in triumph. How's your finger, asshole? Huh? I got you. I got you good, motherfucker. Yeah, fucking fuck you. Harley's gigantic sneakers romped around the garage in meaningless loops. He was unleashing a volley of raw, unearthly screams that threatened to blow the roof clean off. Tools, auto parts, and various other objects whizzed through the air. There was a tremendous crash as Harley overturned the table saw, and another as the lathe was pulled free of its lag bolts and hurled to the floor. The last of the minivan's unbroken windows were shattered above him. The doors and panels were hammered into oblivion. 
A massive hand plunged into the gap at the front of the pit and clenched for Eddie's head. <laughs> Come here, Dink! Come here and say that! Arlie will bite off your face! Paulson scrabbled out of reach and barked out a single gasp of dry, harsh laughter. Ha! You can't get me down here, can you? <laughs> can you? Fuck you, fat boy. Arnie will get you, mister. You hurt his finger. You hurt it a lot, you dink. Go ahead, Eddie panted. Go ahead and try. Try all fucking day. Arlie burst into tears. He fled the garage. Eddie's thin, vicious screech floated after him. I got you this time, cocksucker! I fucking got you! Ha <laughs> ha! Sunday, September 24th, 2 p.m. Eddie awoke to the sound of liquid splattering onto the floor of the pit. A split second later, the sharp, rank stench of urine assaulted his nostrils. Arlie. Arlie was taking a leak into the pit. Oh, you vile piece of shit! Eddie screeched. He scrambled as far away from the puddle as possible and cursed as it steadily grew larger. <laughs> See? Arlie can get you, mister! The piss puddle grew and grew. Arlie had been saving it up for a while, it seemed. By the time the arc had petered out into the last few drops and dribbles, the entire floor of the pit was covered in a thin sheet of cloudy, stinking piss. There you go, mister. Have your drink. Drink it all up. Eddie tried to speak, but he simply couldn't find any words. And why even bother? At this point, words no longer served any purpose. They were weak and insubstantial, puny and worthless. Words and tears, both of them useless. A little while later, Eddie woke from a semi-doze and whispered, I'll kill you, Orly. Then he smiled, razor sharp and bitter as bile. He was sitting in a monster's piss, dying of thirst in a concrete pit. Kill Orly? Really? Words were truly worthless. Sunday, September 24th, 6.12 p.m. The air was cooling down rapidly this evening. It was going to be a chilly night. There was the smell of impending frost in the air. Paulson was sweating, but his teeth were also chattering. Infection had set in into the bite wounds on his arm and the abrasions on his backside. His broken ankle ached and pulsed like a black rotten heart. How bad can this get before it's finally over? How low can I go? Very little of Arlie's piss swamp had evaporated during the course of the afternoon. The floor of the pit was still covered with it. Eddie's coveralls had soaked up the urine like a dry sponge, as did the clothes that he wore beneath it. The feeling was dreadful, but the stink. At least it's keeping me from being hungry. His thirst, however, was an unstoppable rampaging beast of fire and agony. Eddie was going to die of dehydration, and soon. That's fine. Death has got to be better than this. Please, God, let this all end. His bladder was screaming. Eddie had to take a leak again. And he also had to shit, quite badly, in fact. He held it off for as long as he could, but sooner or later, his bowels would win. His captor was out in the backyard attempting to figure out how to shoot the twenty-two caliber rifle that he had found in Eddie's bedroom closet. It wasn't loaded, but the concept of loading and unloading the firearm was well beyond Arlie's limited mechanical comprehension. In any case, it was a bolt-action rifle, and Arlie didn't seem to know enough to pull the bolt back. It was doubtful that he would be able to push his enormous finger into the trigger guard anyway. The little twenty-two looked like a toy in his hands. Nearby, a thick cloud of flies buzzed around the remains of Debbie Hewitt. An identical swarm of the voracious insects were buzzing around the open door of the GMC, feasting on the noxious banquet of John Hewitt's corpse. 
Harley didn't seem to notice. His parents were broken toys, cast aside and already forgotten. Harley's gonna shoot you right in the eye, mister! He pointed the barrel at the caravan and hollered, Pow! Pow! Bang! You hold that thing like a, like a fucking moron, Eddie muttered. He was weary of the clumsy verbal sparring with his cretinous jailer. It was yet another form of torture. I bet it's hard to do when you can't use one of your fingers. How much did that hurt anyway? I'm pretty sure that I heard you crying. Fucking crap, baby. Harley chose to ignore Eddie's abuse and went back to horsing around with the rifle. It was strange to observe Harley at play. How childlike the brute's mannerisms were. He was a nightmarish ogre who enjoyed hopping around like a rabbit, a cannibalistic monster that was prone to chasing after butterflies with squeals of girlish delight. Yep, he's adorable. Paulson had business to attend to, a grim and difficult business that could no longer be ignored. He leaned against the wall and pulled open his coveralls. Eddie had only three functioning fingers and a thumb to work with, but he managed to get the snap of his jeans open and the zipper down with a minimum of difficulty. He let out a gasp and let it fly. You should drink it. His throat said, but his sour, shriveled little stomach countered with an empathetic no. He simply couldn't do it. Eddie's piss splashed into the corner and ran to mix with the vile eye-watering pond that he was already standing in. He yerked dryly after he was done. His bowels chose that moment to cramp hard and made an audible burp sound. There would be no more avoiding the issue. It was coming out and it was coming out now. Eddie pulled down his coveralls and jeans together, spun around to another random corner and let go. He let out a low, miserable groan as the mess jetted from his backside and splattered into the concrete. His lower gut convulsed, and he released a second spray, then a third. When it was over, Eddie pulled up his pants and hobbled over to the opposite corner of the one he had just befouled so thoroughly. There was nowhere to sit that wasn't awash with urine, so Eddie leaned against the wall instead, balancing his weight on his increasingly fatigued good leg. He ran his finger over the sharp edge of the screwdriver. I can't take any more of this. I think I want to kill myself, Eddie whispered. At this point, why not? He wasn't going to last down here for another 48 hours, and why the hell would he want to? He could simply brace the sharp, narrow head of the screwdriver against his heart and fall onto it. As simple as that. The pain would be nothing in comparison to what Eddie was already enduring. So, again, why not? Eddie considered the pros and cons. The pro side of the list was very, very long. As for the con side, here's one. I'm not the one who should die here. Not me. That's bullshit. I'm the good guy. Eddie had to smile at this. A grand fantasy surely it was, but not very practical. Hand-to-hand -hand combat was completely out of the question. Could he talk Arlie into chugging down a lethal dose of antifreeze? Doubtful. Arlie wasn't very bright, but he was cunning. He would see right through Eddie's deception in an instant. Bottom line is, I'm not going to kill myself. Fuck that. I'm going to live. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make it out of here alive. Escape was the only real option. As injured, weak, and sick as he was, it might still be possible. The truck was right fucking there, parked beside the garage. It was less than 30 feet away. The key was in the ignition, just waiting to be turned. Harley was manic, and Harley was demented, yes but everyone needs to shut off and sleep now and then. Eddie might still be able to claw his way out of his minivan-capped tomb and crawl to his salvation while Arlie snored inside the house and dreamed his grotesque dreams. He could escape. He could be free. Yeah, okay. But what if, rather than crawling to the truck, I crawled into the house instead? 
What if I slowly crawled up to that piece of shit while he's asleep with a kitchen knife clenched between my teeth? That's a fucking stupid idea, Eddie muttered. It was worse than that, actually. It was a dangerous idea, but it was an attractive idea as well. His leg was screaming from overexertion. He couldn't hold off the inevitable any longer. Eddie grimaced and slid down the wall to sit in the pool of cold piss. He sat there and shivered, and he wondered what it would be like to watch Arlie die. Monday, September 25th, 2.38 a.m. The garage door screeched open and weak moonlight dribbled into the pit. This could only be a bad thing. Arlie's voice boomed out and echoed around the garage, jovial and crazed. Hey, mister! You sleeping down here? Paulson croaked some dead laughter. Sleeping. Oh, this guy was a riot. When he wasn't burning alive with fever, Eddie was shuddering against the piss-wet chills that threatened to kill him with hypothermia. He simply couldn't believe that he was still alive. It seemed impossible. No, shithead. I'm not sleeping. I'm soaking in piss and it's cold as fuck out here. I'm dying of thirst. And I'm sick now, too. You happy to hear all that? Yep, Harley agreed. Sounds good to Harley. Hey, you kind of sound funny. Why do you sound funny? My nose got broken when you were eating my fucking arm. Harley bites, he said reflectively. Harley gets mad and he bites. Maybe you want some water? There was a muted clink in the darkness followed by the tinkling rasp of a ceramic object being pushed across the cement floor to the edge of the pit. What's that? It's water, you dumb dink. Harley changed his mind. Drink it all up. Eddie's tongue curled in his mouth. It felt like a piece of corrugated cardboard. His hand cautiously stole up to the edge of the pit and encountered something cylindrical and smooth. A coffee mug. It was cold and wet. What did you do to it? Nothing. It's water. Drink it, Dink. Arlie guffawed. <laughs> drink, Dink. Drink, Dink. Drinky, Dinky, you. <laughs> Eddie clamped the mug between his shaken palms and brought it close to his face. He sniffed it, then took a small sip. It was tap water, and it was incredible. Eddie fought the urge to bolt it down and drink it slowly, carefully. His stomach cramped after only three swallows, but he kept going. He was whimpering like a puppy, and he couldn't stop. Water. Arlie was giggling. He clapped his hands together in glee and said, <laughs> Arnie, spit in there, mister. <laughs> you drunk up a bunch of spit. You know what? I don't give a fuck. I'm covered in blood and piss down here. There's wet diarrhea shit smeared up the crack of my ass and I'm dying of thirst. Do you think I give a fuck about something like that right now? Arlie clucked disapprovingly. Know what? You swear too much, mister. No something else? You need to be dead soon. Real soon. That's funny, because I was just thinking the exact same thing about you, bud. You need to be dead. You need it in the worst fucking way. Harley snickered. He hunkered down and fixed his glowing gaze upon the wreck of a man who was curled up below him, just out of reach. You think you can meet up Arlie, mister? Come on out and try. Remember what I did to your face? Your finger? Yeah, you remember. Don't count, Arlie dismissed. You're always hiding down there, getting at Arlie when you know he ain't ready. You cheat. There's more to winning a fight than strength dipshit. You ever hear the story of David and Goliath? Yep. But it don't matter. You'll be dead soon, Mr. Car Fixer. Because Arnie got at you enough already, didn't he? Arnie got you good. 
Eddie opened his mouth to answer and didn't. Why argue? Harley was right. In his current condition, Eddie wasn't long for this world. If dehydration or starvation didn't get him, the infection would. His arm ached and his body felt like an oven. Harley's going to live here when you're dead. This is Harley's house now. Eddie snorted. Yep, that's how it works, all right. If you kill somebody, you're allowed to move into his house. You're a fucking moron. Shut up, Dink. Don't say that word. You think you're smart? Yeah, right. If you're so smart, how come you're down there with all the pee, mister? Huh? How come? Eddie's fever-curled rage boiled up into his throat and he roared. No, you shut up, you fucking freak. I'm down here because of you. And there's piss down here because of you. Why don't you go fuck yourself? Oh, you want to yell and be all loud, mister? Okay, sure. Artie can make noise, too. There was a clatter from the direction of the workbench, and then Arley began to slam some metallic object off the floor with air-whistling force. The piercing ring was nothing short of brain shredding down in the pit. It was unbearable. Eddie clapped his palms to his ears and screamed, Fuck you! Stop! Stop that! But Arley didn't even hear him. Sparks flew in the darkness. Stop it! Stop it! Oh, you motherfucker, stop it! The racket abruptly ceased. A ferocious, high-pitched buzz bounced between Paulson's ears like a ball of robotic hornets. His head ached savagely. Pretty soon, mister. You'll be dead pretty soon. Arley knelt beside the caravan and threw his noisemaker into the pit where it bounced off the floor and whacked Eddie in the chest. It was a long, slender metal bar of some kind, and Eddie sorely wished that he could ram it down Arley's throat. Just slam it in there and give it a good hard shove. <sighs> Brains over brawn, Eddie gasped in the dark. That's how a war is won in the long run, you stupid bastard. Why don't you go fuck off now? I'm bored of you. You better hope you don't freeze down there like an icicle tonight, mister. You better hope you're dead in the morning, because you're bad, and Arnie's going to get you. Sooner or later. Arnie trailed off, then snapped his teeth together in the darkness. Monday, September 25th, 1.25 p.m. Eddie was startled from his fetal position stupor on the floor of the pit by the choking stench of decay. He gagged. Arley was dragging something into the garage, a limp object that slid wetly across the floor behind them. Eddie heard the angry buzzing of dozens of flies, and his only thought was, Oh, Jesus, please, not this. Arnie don't want you to be all lonely down there, Minter. So he brought you a friend. Eddie shrieked. Arnie, please no. For God's sake, no. And was answered by laughter, high and raspy and full of dark joy. Arnie dragged Eddie's new companion to the front of the minivan and began to stuff it through the gap. A leg snapped in half during the process prompting Arley to squeal in delight and gibber nonsensically at the top of his lungs. He resorted to stomping on his mother's stubborn corpse until it finally squeezed through and tumbled into the pit, skeletal and ragged and explosively rancid from days of exposure in the sun. The thing's eyes were blank, weeping sockets. Mrs. Hewitt had been reduced by the ravages of nature to a skeletal effigy of decay. A thing that visibly twitched and squirmed with untold number of maggots. There you go, mister. See? Now you won't be lonely no more. Paulson screamed himself hoarse. His weak cries were soon drowned out by the buzzing of the flies, who quickly found their feast again. Not satisfied with sticking to the original menu, many of the flies began to circle and nip at Eddie. 
who flailed and slapped at them hysterically. After a while, he retreated like a turtle into his coveralls to escape them. They would have been too snug for this tactic on Saturday, but that was before Eddie had started the Arlie Hewitt diet and exercise plan. The combination of agony, fear, sleeplessness, thirst, hunger, and fever was extremely effective. Eddie hummed to himself to dampen out the mindless one-toned buzzing of countless wings. It was maddening. I could feel you staring at me, he whimpered. Stop it. Stop staring at me. The flies buzzed and buzzed, and Debbie Hewitt continued to stare at her new roommate with empty eye sockets. Eddie rocked back and forth on the floor and hummed to himself inside his coveralls. It was all he could think to do. Tuesday, September 26, 8.37 a.m. At first, Eddie assumed that the sound was just part of his fever dream, a surreal world of fantastic shapes and colors, a mystical paradise where people from the real world mingled with the strange creatures that lived in his subconscious mind. Overall, the fever dream was an interesting and whimsical place, leagues ahead of his current reality. But the sound kept growing and swelling until it was a throaty, stone-popping roar, and the fever dream fell into scattered pieces. Eddie found himself laying curled up on his side, his injured arm cradled to his chest and his back to the wall. The smell of his prison scampered up his nostrils and overwhelmed him a foul aural tapestry woven from the sharp, bitter scent of urine, the necrotic stench of the deceased Mrs. Hewitt, and the low, sour smell of his own fevered carcass. He retched, but the sour little raisin that used to be Eddie Paulson's stomach had nothing left to expel. The roar kept swelling. Eddie could hardly believe what he was hearing. It was the sound of tires rolling up the winding gravel road that ended at his driveway. A car was approaching. Eddie tried to scrabble to his feet but failed to make it on the first try. He was frighteningly weak. As the vehicle slowed to pull into his driveway, he clawed and struggled his way up the wall and staggered to the rear of the pit. He watched with bulging eyes and trembling lips as a Norfolk County OPP cruiser pulled into his driveway. Cops. It's the fucking cops. Yes. The cops spotted John's bloodied legs hanging out of the GMC and the cruiser ground to a halt in a plume of dust. He popped out of the car like a jack-in-the-box, his gun already drawn. The cop's face was a grim, rigid mask beneath his mirrored shades. He was a large, powerfully built man, armed with a forty caliber semi-automatic pepper spray and a high-powered taser. Eddie feared for his life. Look out, he croaked. Yelling shredded his arid throat, but he paid it no mind. There's a... There's a fucking psychopath running around on the loose. He killed... The cop wheeled around quick as a cat and leveled his sidearm at the open bay of the garage. He bellowed. Whoever's in that garage, you better come out with your hands on your head. Immediately. Do you understand? Right now. I can't. I'm trapped underneath the vehicle in the garage pit. And I'm hurt pretty bad. The cop hesitated, then said, Are you Eddie Paulson? I'm Constable Whitaker from the Norfolk County Detachment of the... I can see that, Eddie called back. I'm Eddie Paulson, yeah. Pleased to meet you. So, like I said already, I could use some help down here. Please. Please come out with your hands on your head, Mr. Paulson. Nice and slow, the cop said mechanically, and Eddie gritted his teeth. He hissed, Oh, for fuck's sake. Then he drew in a deep breath and hollered, Listen to me, okay? Listen. I'm trapped underneath the goddamn minivan in here. Do you follow me? I'm a mechanic. The dead guy in the cargo van out there was a customer named John Hewitt. His wife, Debbie, she's down here with me. She's dead. 
Their own son fucking ripped them apart with his teeth, and I'm not shitting you. He's a mutant of some kind, and he's only half brat, and he's fucking crazy as hell. I don't know what happened to his mother when she was carrying him, but he's huge and ugly, and his goddamn teeth. I say come out, the constable barked. Listen to what I'm saying, goddamn you. The crazy son of a bitch could still be around here somewhere, and he's dangerous. Eddie was getting dizzy from all the effort of standing and yelling. <sighs> He's a fucking psycho. Call for backup, man. I'm not fucking kidding you. Call for help right now. And an ambulance. I'm hurt. The cop was slowly edging around the vehicle, the business end of his gun pointed unwaveringly at the open garage door. The stiff set of Whitaker's jaw suggested he was not about to be ordered around by the disembodied voice of a possible murderer. Eddie was beside himself. You fucking idiot. Why won't you listen to me? Officer, how can I make you understand that you are in danger right now? How can I? Shut up. I told you to come out with your hands up, and I'm not telling you again. The cop was halfway between the GMC and the garage now, and his face was pale beneath his farmer's tan. He had made the mistake of taking a good look at what was left of John Hewitt. If I have to take you out of there myself, Mr. Paulson, you will regret it. This is your last warning. Follow my orders and come out with your hands up now. Fine. You go ahead and do what you need to do then, Eddie gasped. There was no point in further argument. You go right ahead and take me out of here. I'd like to see that. I've been trying to get out of here for days. Be my guest. The cop carefully stalked into the interior of the garage. Eddie heard him choke on Mrs. Hewitt's delicate new fragrance and found himself grinning a small, mean grin. Not very nice, is it? I barely even noticed it anymore. What in the hell? Ah, oh, Jesus! Eddie kept silent and watched the constable's boots stalk around the garage searching for potential felons. When they were satisfied that the garage was clear, the boots clomped over to the driver's side of the van and the cop hunkered down on his hands and knees. The light was dim in the shadowed recess of the pit, so Constable Whitaker clicked on his mag light to take a better look. He gasped. Holy God, he whispered. What happened to you? Eddie grimaced up into the cold white beam of light and said, For crying out loud, man, I fucking told you already. There's a monster running around on the loose. He eats people, and he's bigger than Andre the Giant. That's what happened to me. Who... <clears throat> The cop cleared his throat and briefly aimed the light at Debbie's mutilated corpse. Who was that? Her name was Debbie Hewitt. She stinks pretty fucking bad, doesn't she? She's full of maggots. Second generation by now. Maybe even third. Eddie grimaced. Pretty soon the flies will be laying eggs on me, too. Might have done it already while I was passed out. Who knows? I'll get you out of there as soon as possible, Mr. Paulson. I... I've never... My God. The cop's eyes were wide with pools of revolted disbelief. Would you please get that shit out of my eyes? Whitaker pointed the flashlight away and it revealed the corner of the pit that had borne the brunt of Eddie's last bowel movement. He muttered something under his breath and shut it off. How long have you been down there? Since Saturday afternoon, Eddie wheezed. His thoughts were becoming murky again. The fever dreams were gathering on his brain's horizon. He wrapped his swollen, infected arm against the wall, and the resulting shock of misery blew them apart. He grinned against the agony. So, I don't know. What's today's date, anyway? Fuck me. You have been down here for four days? Whitaker was at a loss for words. My God, how, how did you... Jesus. The key for the van. Is it still in the ignition? 
No. John forgot to leave it behind, probably in his pocket. Eddie was racked by a sledgehammer blast of the chills. His teeth chattered. Listen, officer. I'm sick and I need water. Bring me some, please. And then you need to call for backup, and I mean right away. And call for an ambulance. And for Christ's sake, be careful. He'll kill you. I'm not fucking kidding. Whitaker stared down at Eddie for a moment longer, then sprang to his feet and jogged out to his cruiser. He opened the passenger door and grabbed something, a bottle of water. The young cop took a nervous look around, then ducked back into the cruiser to speak urgently into the radio. The reply he received was evidently not to his liking. Eddie heard Whitaker yell, All of them? And his heart sank. Wow, what a surprise. Something's going wrong. Fuck. The cop jogged back to the garage, gun in one hand and the bottle of water in the other. He knelt down and thrust the bottle beneath the van. Eddie seized it with a whimper on his lips. <sighs> Every available unit is tied up with a bad accident out on County Road 55. They can't send anyone out this way for a while. Maybe a few hours. So, we're just going to have to sit tight here and wait for someone to come help, Mr. Paulson. <sighs> Fuck that, Eddie gasped. He slugged back a large gulp from the bottle and struggled fiercely against the stomach cramps that threatened to expel the swallow right back up again. His throat sang with joy. Water. Sweet, clear, lovely, wet water. <sighs> Go fish the key out of his pocket. I know it's fucking disgusting, and believe me, I don't give a shit. Get it. In a minute. How long has it been since you last saw the Hewitt son? It's been a while, since late last night, I guess. I've been in and out of consciousness all morning, though. I'm sick as hell. Fever. Infection. Listen, officer. Get me out of here. I need a doctor. I'm dying. Get me out. I need to have a look around the premises first, Mr. Paulson. He might still be here. We don't know. No. Don't leave me down here, not even for one minute. Don't leave me alone in the dark with that, that putrid thing and the flies and, and my own shit. I know. I'm really sorry, but this will be quick, Whitaker soothed. You'll be okay for a few more minutes, and I'll be okay too. I'm armed. Just hang tight, and I'll be right back, I promise. <laughs> Don't go! Eddie screeched, and the piercing note of hysteria in his voice threatened to tear his vocal cords. For Christ's sake, man, don't leave me here and get yourself fucking killed. Don't you dare. Mr. Paulson, Eddie, this won't take long. If you haven't seen him since last night, he's probably long gone. I just have to clear the premises, that's all, okay? I have to, it's my job. You'll be all right down here for just a little bit longer, I promise you. You don't understand. He's not human. He's a... A monster. The word died in Eddie's mouth. The cop was gone. All he could do was wait. The minutes ticked by. Eddie shriveled into complete despair a little more with each sweep of the minute hand on his watch. Twelve minutes later, Whitaker was back, kneeling beside the caravan with his lip curled in disgust. He said, Looks like it cleared out. Your house is quite a mess. It's... I guess you'll see it soon enough. I hope you have insurance. I don't care about the house, Eddie growled. I just want the fuck out of here. Go get the key, for fuck's sake, man. Get me out of here. Whitaker nodded with his lips clamped together in a tight, sour little line. He visibly steeled himself against the awful task at hand. The young cop came back empty-handed and with a look of deep repulsion stamped on his face. He was beyond pale at this point. Whitaker's complexion had a distinct greenish tinge. Couldn't find anything in his pockets. Maybe he dropped his keys in the yard somewhere? I don't know. Eddie snarled. Fuck it. Grab a jack then. Jack this thing up and get me out of this goddamn pit. No, not that floor, Jack. It gave up the ghost a while back. There's a bottle jack over there on the workbench. 
It'll do. Get this bitch in the air and hurry. Whitaker pawed through the tools and various mechanical detritus on the bench and found the jack. He paused. Wait, where's the handle? Paulson spat. Oh, for fuck's sake. And he ground the heels of his palms against his temples. Uh, okay, where the hell is... Just look around, you'll see it. There might be another one over in the far corner. On the shelf, I think. Uh, a scissor jack. Oh, wait a second. The combination of hunger, dehydration, and fever was making him stupid. The jack handle was with him in the pit, lying on the floor amongst the bolts and assorted hardware that Arley had thrown at him in a fit of rage. Had that been last night or the night before? Had he been trapped four days now, or longer? It's been a long time. A long, long time, Eddie whispered to himself. He knelt down and awkwardly fished the handle to his freedom off the dirty, piss-stinking floor. Debbie Hewitt stared at him, withered and jealous of Eddie's windfall of good luck. Fuck you, Debbie, Eddie croaked. I'm out of here. There was a strangled cry above him. It was followed by the dull smack of a body hitting the floor. Something skittered into the pit and bounced off Eddie's foot. It was the cop's mirrored sunglasses. Fuck! Eddie clawed his way up the wall and came eye to bulging eye with Constable Whitaker, who was being pressed flat to the floor by a size 18 foot. Enormous, dirty, and bare. The foot was covered in mud and bits of leaves. Whitaker was bleeding from the top of his head. Arnie seen you driving up, Mr. Policeman. The foot twisted back and forth. Whitaker's eyes bulged out even further. So Arnie took off his shoes and ran out into the woods, all sneaky, sneaky. Arnie can tiptoe around real quiet when he wants to. He giggled and added, He's <laughs> standing on you is fun. The cop's eyes pleaded with Eddie to do something, anything. His face was turning purple. Eddie dropped the jack handle and went for the screwdriver in his pocket. His broken pinky got caught in the belt loop and Eddie screamed. An undulating war cry of pain and fury. He tore his finger free and sank the screwdriver into the hollow between Arlie's gigantic big toe and the next. Lips skinned back from his teeth in a primal snarl. Blood spurted and Harley howled. The foot jerked away and Whitaker lurched to his feet, scrabbling at his holster and coughing explosively. Harley charged into him with an animal roar and three shots boomed out. Definitely loud within the confines of the garage. Eddie's hearing was immediately shattered. His head filled with a piercing buzz and the rest of the world fell silent. Two pairs of feet briefly engaged in a silent struggle dance at the front of the caravan. The cop's shiny leather boots abruptly lifted off the floor and disappeared from view. Blood drizzled down onto the dirty gray cement in large drips and splatters. So much blood. Seconds later, Whitaker plummeted back to the floor, his face a churned-up horror of red meat and yellowish-white bone. Blood pumped from the cop's torn throat and stung Eddie's eyes. Whitaker's fingers drummed a frantic beat against the floor as he died. Arlie hunkered down beside the body and gave Eddie Paulson a wide, red-smeared grin. Arlie now sported a large, bleeding hole in his sweatshirt just beneath his collarbone, but he didn't seem to notice. Eddie ducked away from a pan-sized hand and his good foot slipped on the scattered bolts and hardware that littered the floor. His fatigued legs skittered beneath him and unhinged at the knee, and all of Eddie's weight landed squarely on his broken ankle. The agony was immense, indescribable. It was like being reborn. He collapsed against the wall and Arlie's snatching hand blindly seized a greasy handful of his wild, corkscrewed hair. Eddie wailed in terror. Gotcha! Arlie boomed. Gotcha real good this time, mister. Come here! The monster's gaping mouth filled Eddie's field of vision. 
Strings of meat and shredded skin hung from his teeth. Grizzly party streamers to welcome Eddie to the afterlife. Arlie's breath smelled of curdled blood and rotten meat. It smelled of murderous desires that had been left somewhere damp and dark to fester and sprout noxious blooms of insanity. A fragment of thought flitted across his panic like a bird. Take your fucking eye. And Eddie sank the sharp edge of the screwdriver into Arlie's monstrous left eyeball. <coughs> it burst like a rotten grape and the screwdriver slid forward without resistance, not stopping until the handle butted up against his eye socket. Arlie squawked, releasing his grip on Eddie's hair and began to jitter and flop around on his massive gut, looking like a breakdancer doing the worm. Eddie roared. I told you! I fucking told you I'd do it! I fucking told you! And he wrenched the handle back and forth, up and down, his face a mask of hate. The Hewitt's unfortunate progeny stiffened like a board and shit himself explosively. A tongue lolled out of his mouth and lashed around like an angry cobra. Moments later, Arlie's lower jaw snapped shut and his tongue fell to the concrete with a small wet plop. I told you, didn't I? Eddie panted. I told you I'd take your ride next time, and I fucking did it, didn't I? Yeah, motherfucker! Yeah! Eddie's roar spiked to a hysterical shriek. I fucking killed your ass dead, so fuck you! He gave the screwdriver one last back and forth just for good measure. Arlie's spasms became more random, weak and sporadic. Eventually, they tapered off until they were only slight twitches, and then nothing at all. Trembling, Eddie fished the jack handle off the floor and lifted the caravan until there was four inches of clearance between the front wheels and the garage floor, which was as far as the jack would go. It was enough. It would have to be enough. Am I strong enough to do this? <sighs> You'll be as strong as you have to be, Eddie Bosson. He said out loud and took in a deep, shuddering breath. He was crying. <sighs> Hear me? You'll be as strong as you have to <sighs> A band of cold iron encircled his neck. It was Arlie's hand. His remaining eye was staring at nothing. He was smiling. Eddie squealed and beat at Arlie's grasp with flailing arms like sticks. He couldn't fucking breathe, and his vision was becoming spotty. It was fading, and the two of them would die together. Just Eddie and his old pal Arlie. The Jack. Pull the goddamn Jack. Eddie reached out, searching blindly and he clamped his palms around the base of the jack. Die, you son of a bitch. The slim cylinder scraped across the floor, and the van tilted to a precarious angle above them. It teetered, wobbled like a rolling egg, then plummeted down onto Arlie's unprotected cranium with an enormous... <laughs> For a moment, the hand around Eddie's throat squeezed almost hard enough to crack his esophagus. Then it relaxed, went limp, and released him. Eddie collapsed and coughed miserably. His throat felt destroyed. He could taste hot blood, salty and thick. He waited on the floor of the pit until he was satisfied that Arlie wasn't going to move again. Debbie Hewitt gaped sightlessly at him from her own tangled position on the floor. Eye sockets buzzing with flies. Eddie stared right back. Not gonna miss you, bitch, he croaked. Not one bit. It took a long time, but Eddie finally managed to get the van back into the air. He began the slow, painful process of crawling out of his tomb and into freedom. Tuesday, September 26, 4.41 p.m. Of course it wasn't funny. There wasn't anything funny about it at all, really. But Eddie Paulson had to laugh anyway. 
It had taken a long, long time to worm his way out of the pit. <laughs> he crawled to his truck on his belly, sweating and mewling and pleading to God or any deity that might listen for help. Eddie surmounted the insurmountable and somehow managed to pull himself up into the cab of the truck. He had made it. He had fucking made it. And the key was in the ignition, all right, just like he knew it would be. But the battery was dead. He had left the glove box open. The bulb inside had slowly drained the old battery until it was dead as stone. Eddie laughed. He laughed and wept and laughed again. And his eyelids grew heavy. The fevered dreams were waiting. They welcomed him with open arms. Wednesday, September 27th. 1.58 p.m. Oh, where the hell is this place? Mark was going to be late for the appointment, no doubt about it. Where the hell was this guy? A long gravel road, well, a lane, really, just off of Tunnel Line. That's what the guy had told him over the phone. Can't miss it. Well, apparently he could miss it. He could miss it completely. Mark turned around in some farmer's driveway and headed back down the road. Surely he'd find it this time. If he ended up hitting the 55 again, well, then he'd try one more time and that would be it. Oh, for crying out loud, it's right there. How'd I miss it? Mark turned onto the narrow pothole bedeviled road and followed it until it petered out into a scraggly looking driveway. The driveway ambled between two fields that had long since been let go to pasture and ended at a spacious country lot, a scraggly stretch of land that was dominated by a large garage with rusted out siding. The accompanying house was the typical post-war shoebox, squat and covered with an ugly husk of peeling blue paint. The mailbox out front bore two rows of stick-on letters. They spelled out E. Paulson and then, no junk mail. Mark was pretty sure that this was the right place. There appeared to be multiple vehicles parked on the property in a haphazard fashion, awaiting their turn under the wrench. Mark wheeled into the driveway and immediately gasped, Oh, what the shit! He jumped hard on the brakes. There were multiple police cruisers and SUVs parked in front of him. Most of them were provincial cops, but two of them were RCMP. Mark's first thought was drug bust. He noticed that there was also a van present, a van that had the words OPP Forensic Identification Unit emblazoned across the side. Two men in yellow biohazard suits were loading a gurney into the back. The gurney was loaded down with a zippered bag. Is that a body bag? What the... A burly, scowling man stormed down the driveway and barked. Hold up! Throw it in park and stay right where you are, bud! The scowling man was dressed in casual office attire and was sweating buckets under the glare of the midday sun. He squinted into Mark's window and shook his head, a dramatic show of distrust and irritation. I've got a question for you, bud. What the hell are you doing here? I have an appointment with Mr. Paulson for two. I was going to get a new head gasket put in, Mark stammered. He had a small bag of weed in his pocket. Not much, but enough. He tried to not look nervous and failed. The beefy face in his window gave him a hard grin and said, Head gasket shot, is it? That's a bitch. What's your name, kiddo? Mark? He can smell it. He can smell it. Well, let me introduce myself, Mark. My name's Detective Dave Lamont, and I'm with the RCMP. Homicide. How about you let me take a gander at your driver's license, bucko? Mark handed it over. Lamont glowered at it with hard, shrewd eyes, then handed it back. Mark, it looks like your head gasket won't be getting fixed today. Get my drift? Now, I'm going to need to ask you a few questions, but I don't have the time for it at the moment. So why don't you give me a number you can be reached at? Then head on back home and wait for my call, okay? Um, Mark said, and he tried to think of something to follow it up with, but couldn't. Homicide detective, 
murder. Holy fuck. The detective raised a bushy eyebrow and said, You got something to say, Mark? Something you'd like to share, maybe? No, sir, not at all. He rattled off his number and the detective jotted it down in a tattered notepad. Okay, got it. Be on your way now, Mark, and don't stray too far from the phone. I'll be calling you soon. The homicide detective stepped back from Mark's window and patted the hood of the car as he walked away. See you soon. The forensic guys were bringing out more body bags on gurneys. Mark stared at them as he awkwardly backed up onto the patchy lawn to make his exit. He wondered about them on his way back to town, who they might have been in life, and how they might have died. He debated whether or not he should post about it on social media. In the end, he remembered the look in the homicide detective's eyes, and he decided that it would probably be a bad idea. And that was In the Pit by T.W. Grimm. A good reminder why car repairs are so damn expensive. Uncover one problem and you're bound to find another. A little about the author. T.W. Grimm lives in southwestern Ontario. He is the author of 99 Brief Scenes from the End of the World, Trippin' Over Twilight, When the Stars Fall, and most recently from Veloc's books, A Different Kind of Magic, which he would love you to check out. You can find T.W. Grimm on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash T.W. Grimm author and on Twitter or whatever it's called at T.W. Grimm official. He's got a Patreon too and that's patreon.com forward slash T.W. Grimm. Tell him Drew Blood sent you. Thanks T.W. And do me a favor would you? Subscribe to this podcast wherever you do your listening and leave me a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. I need soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and I appreciate it. To hear a premium mad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook. And we're accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, send it to DrewBloodHorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. Ten Bananas. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways. At least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, friend. And don't forget your binkle. I'd hate to see you without it. Attendance is mandatory next week, friend. We've got one hell of a Christmas special for you this year. And it's our last chance to be naughty until Santa shows up. So may the wind be at your back. And may the road rise up to meet you. And until next time, friends. Go fuck yourselves. <laughs> Good night, y'all. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.